Welcome back to uh, Business Week here on Arise News. So we're going to get into some of the week's uh, top business headlines from around the world. Uh, we first, of course, in our Abuja studio, Kelvin Emanuel, co-founder and CEO of Dairy Hills Limited, also a public policy analyst and economist. And with me here in Lagos, Esther Gundele, business development and economic growth lead at DAI Nigeria. Uh, she, of course, published two books. She's a first class degree in economics and, of course, uh, a lot, very knowledgeable, as is Kelvin on this particular matter. So welcome to the both of you. I guess we can start with Germany and uh, this seven billion package of corporate tax relief. Maybe you can call it uh, tax palliatives uh, for businesses in Germany. Uh, Esther, what do you make of that decision by the government? Oh, to, uh, so firstly, thank you for having me. Always great to be on the show. Yes, was it expected? It was certainly expected because we have indeed seen the um, German economy and Germany is and used to be the giant of the EU region, right? And we've seen their numbers, their growth actually stagnate in the last couple of months. Yeah, so I think that everybody was expecting it. What economists and analysts have said in Germany is that how significant is the 7 billion euros? It looks huge, but when you put it alongside an economy that is about 4 trillion euros, right? How significant is that? But important to note that it's just part of the package, in quotes, right? Because the um, the German government has actually um, this week launched the 10-point plan that speaks to many of the other challenges that businesses are going through in towards stimulating the economy of um, German. All right, all right. Uh, Kelvin, what do you think about this? Uh, is this how palliatives should be done for businesses? Maybe we call it corporate palliatives. What do you make of it, uh, Kelvin? Good morning, Rotus, and good morning, Esther. Thank you so much for having me, Rotus, as always. Now, look, I, I am looking at the 7.1 billion euro um, palliative, tax palliative, and I'm looking at the fact that um, Olaf Scholz actually has a coalition that brought him back as um, the prime minister of um, Germany. Um, you have two other parties that forms a coalition. I'm also looking at the fact that Germany has a debt to GDP ratio of 66.1%, and energy and food inflation has caused Germany to have an unbalanced budget for the first time since um, Angela Merkel left as um, the Chancellor of um, Germany. And I, I can't help, Rotus, but wonder that at the time when the likes of Germany and the UK, the leading economies in Europe, are having unbalanced budget and are having to borrow money to fund their budget, and they are having um, debts, and the debt to GDP ratio is rising, even if they still have a balanced um, debt servicing to government revenue ratio as compared to Nigeria, Nigeria has problems with um, its budget. And if you look at it very well, you see, if Europe has energy issues because of rising energy prices, the cost of LNG that went up to highs never seen, the cost of pipe natural gas per standard cubic feet, um, the price of crude oil that is currently $88 per barrel, why do we have, as oil producing countries and gas, not taking advantage of it. That's the angle I'm looking at it from. Now, as to your question on is freezing tax and you know, um, giving businesses tax palliative the solution in Nigeria, to be honest with you, I think the federal government is in the right direction of trying to harmonize taxes to um, avoid the um, duplicity of taxes across uh, federate, uh, federating units. Um, the government is also in the right direction of um, trying to, you know, freeze the Finance Act of 2023 that was passed by the former finance minister in certain areas before she left and the new government took over. I think more can be done, but I'll wait to see the, the action plan, the comprehensive action plan of the Fiscal Reform Committee of um, this government before I make further comments on it. All right, thanks, Elvin. Right, let's, let's get to, uh, you know, since we're on, talking Africa now, uh, Esther, the coup in Gabon, what it means for the region, trade, the markets. How are you interpreting what's happening there? Yeah, I mean, the coup, our dear Gabon that is a member of OPEC. So um, Gabon is a member of OPEC. They produce about 200,000 um, barrels of oil um, daily. And but if, if we look at it in terms of global supply, right, that's just about a 0.2 percent, right? Even right. if you look at it in terms of Nigeria, what Nigeria is producing and all. So we don't expect that it will shake things 
really in in the oil um, oil sector right in terms of supply however gabon is one of the top producers of manganese right in africa and even globally so they produce about 4.2 million metric tons of manganese and manganese is an essential you know is manganese um, uranium those are natural resources that many countries need for steel and other activities so what we saw, I mean, this week was that a company that is based there, Eramet, they actually altered production for a while. I mean, just to watch things, be sure their employees are safe and all. If that continues, then we'll see an impact in terms of the prices of manganese. Okay, so that's it at the trade level. When we talk about, I mean, Africa, right? I mean, the main countries that... Um, that Gabon trades with are its border countries. Cameroon, Congo, I saw your analysis showed that, oh, the borders are closed. So there will be that impact, right? Because many people's jobs and lives are dependent on those um, trading activities and also definitely an impact. The second part to it is in terms of investment, right? Over the years, we've seen Gabon try to diversify its economy and it's a beautiful place, by the way. So they attract tourists every year in, in hundreds of thousands. But what happens in situations like this is that everybody just basically cancels the country in terms of whether it's holiday or even in terms of investment and all. So I think it will impact their investment. Um, and lastly, I would say that we did see their government yesterday come up with a four point agenda and what we saw in it was that they actually plan to repay some of the debts look out mm. debts right and that's that was an interesting one to see so perhaps we have a leader that is business and investment savvy <laughs> we have to wait to see what i mean comes up in the next couple of weeks thank you for that esther yeah uh, kelvin what do you make of the um developments there i mean you you focus a lot of uh, on agriculture and so on trade how, how are you interpreting what's happening in, in gabon well rotus look esther, esther made very valid points about manganese and about the fact that the companies who are exploring and mining crude oil in gabon have actually come out to put out a statement that the coup has not deterred or distorted the operations which is a good development you could see that um, crude oil price is ticking up on the optics, not on the actual reality of what is going on in Gabon, given that Gabon is actually an OPEC member. But, you know, generally I'm concerned about the spate of um, coups in Central and, and in West Africa, especially Francophone. And the reason is because if, if you look at Niger, for example, you realize that Niger that just had a coup um, close to two months ago, you realize that um, Niger has actually put, like, a spanner in the wheel works of the trans sahara gas pipeline, 4,128 kilometers that was supposed to go through right of way to Algeria. So for me, I, I am looking at it and I'm asking myself, um, Gabon does not pose direct economic threats to Nigeria, but then the, the fact that it, it's, it, it, if a coup happens in one country and it's not addressed by um, the ECOWAS or COMESA or SADC, or the African Union, um, the military in another country will grow balls. So we have like, okay, maybe we can do it also. It, it goes, you know, that network effect and ripple reaction, that, that, that's my concern. But, but I don't really think that Gabon poses any economic threat or Nigeria has any economic interest tied to, to it as Niger has to Nigeria. Thanks for that. I, I see a theme here. We've talked, you know, we've mentioned debts in Europe we mentioned, you mentioned repaying debts uh, for Gabon. So now we come to Nigeria now. President Tinubu saying that, you know, we can't keep using 90 plus percent of our revenues to, to pay off debt. Esther, I, I take it you would agree with that? Certainly, totally agree and all. Yeah, so he did state that on Monday. And I mean, we're on the path. And as I talked about this um, when I heard the statement, there are three parts to us reducing the percentage of one's revenue. The first, okay, not within our control is you go to your creditors and you ask for forgiveness, <laughs> right? Okay, or you ask renegotiate terms. That's totally external. I don't think that, I mean, I know government will make efforts towards that, but I mean, that's not within our control. The second is revenue and to increase one's revenue, the country's revenue. And that's been the conversation, right? So Revenue, revenue, revenue. How do we increase our revenue? We saw that the um, government was very quick to set up the tax reform committee. Okay, and that committee really is on how do we ensure that tax administration is more efficient and all. And hopefully that can assist in increasing revenue in the coming 
period. Um, very important, right? And we must not forget this. And I saw it in news headlines today. Is our oil production, right? That has been at a low low in recent time. We're not even able to meet the quota that OPEC has given us of 1.7 million. We're still around, I think Q2 was about 1.22, right? And I mean, it's important revenue that we need to bring back and all. So that's the second around increasing revenue. The third, of course, and the last one has to do with expenditure. And the government cannot reduce expenditure because, I mean, government spending feeds into the economy. So you don't want governments reducing expenditure. But what you actually want them doing, which we've seen signs around it, is reprioritizing expenditure. So what are we spending all our money on? We saw, of course, for subsidy removal shows that there are signs to prioritize expenditure, the right things. And yesterday, the Minister of Finance, Mr. Wally, actually spoke and said that this government is going to focus on efficient government expenditure. And, I mean, I'm hoping that conversations around cost of governance is still, I mean, we hear something about that um, to come. So those are the three parts um, towards ensuring that we're not spending a large portion of our money just servicing debt, not gotcha. even paying the capital. Thank, thank, thanks for the breakdown. So, so Kelvin, what do you make of that? You know, one, ask for credit relief from your, your creditors. Uh, two, raise your revenues, or three, reduce expenditure. I mean, th it was this week uh, President Tinubu did say uh, that I guess the folks traveling with him to the United Nations General Assembly, if you have nothing to do with it, you're not going. So that, that was an announcement that was made, I guess, towards the expenditure side that Esther's talking about. But Calvin, you've talked a lot about debts in this country. So what do you make of the words? And I guess you're looking for actions. Well, Ruth is, um, you know, between 2024 and 2026, the government needs to pay $4.2 billion in coupons and um, refinancing wow. costs to creditors. The problem is always, is not with multilateral um, debts. The problem is not with um, bilateral partners. The problem is always in the capital markets with the euro bonds. Euro bonds are like five times what your bilateral partners and multilateral banks give you in terms of uh, coupons. And the, the, the problem with euro bonds, for example, is that um, you have this effect of inflation, rising inflation. So as inflation goes up, your monetary policy committee at the central bank does monetary policy tightening to you know, try to roll back inflation. And in Nigeria, inflation doesn't respond to monetary policy, unfortunately, because there's distortion in the reporting of, the, of data and in the administration of um, monetary policy you have what they call your convexity in your inflation to interest yield curve. So the fixed income market typically tracks your inflation to interest yield curve. As inflation goes up, interest rates are adjusted, the yields also fall, and they try to adjust to prevent a negative return on yield for investors, which is the reason foreign portfolio investors are talking about not coming into Nigeria because um, as at three, maybe four or five weeks ago, Yields on treasury, um, treasury bills were somewhere around 5.9%, and the CBN has been adjusting it. The latest, the latest is somewhere above 13.5%, I believe. Now, you see, the problem in Nigeria is that we, pre-2000, um, um, after 2014, 2015, the government embarked on a change in the fiscal strategy in the medium-term expenditure framework. It migrated from revenue, it migrated to debt. Under the previous, the, past two administrations, 2014 before the immediate past president took over, you had what they call your deficit financing at somewhere between 16.7% and 17.2%. When this past government left and President Tinubu took over, that debt financing had risen to 43.8%, which means that your budget had a deficit financing of 43.8%. So you typically go to your euro bonds market, you go to your bonds market in Nigeria, um, treasury bills, um, treasury bonds, you go to multilateral banks, you go to development banks, you go to your bilateral partners. If they refuse to give you money, or if your credit rating is junk, Nigeria's credit rating currently is junk, CA1 for Moody's, C, uh, B- minus for Fitch and Standard and, Standard and Poor's, they won't borrow you money because the yields will be um, um, ridiculous. You have to rely on ways and means, which you saw happen with the old saga of um, you take public sector CRR, which was... Um, at 0%, you take private sector CR at 32.5% uh, deposit warehouse at the vaults of the CBN, you borrow the federal government, they're unable to pay back, you sterilize it into a 40-year government bond. And you have this cycle. So for example, 
That 40-year government bond of 23.7 trillion that has been securitized, for example, it has a three-year moratorium. The government, the Nigerian government, will start provisioning in its budget in 2026, and they'll be paying from 2026 2.8 trillion naira yearly in interest to the Central Bank of Nigeria. You know? So uh, Wale Edu has a role of increasing both tax and non-tax revenue. Non-tax revenue from government-owned enterprises, um, independent revenue sources, um, NNPC, um, NLNG, um, then the tax revenue sources, currently at 7.9%. Every 1% he raises it, he will add $4.4 billion in revenue collections to the federal government. So if, if, he, if he can pull off increasing the capacity of NLNG, and I've have said this severally, that look, gas is going to be the savior of Nigeria. It's good to harmonize the taxes. It's good to fight under assessment by rogue tax officials. It's good to um, collect, centralize the tax functions and collect all the MDAs to FIRS, which is the right thing to do. But it's also important to realize that Nigeria has a comparative advantage. And what is that? Your frontier basins, your deep inland, your shallow waters, your deep offshore, increase the number of rigs, get your minister of gas resources to change the um, policy framework in the um, Petroleum Industry Act to see that you can bring in investors to invest in um, gas gathering infrastructure. You can bring in investors to invest in high, tre high pressure transmission pipe. Look, you have the NMGP, Nigerian, um, gas, um, Nigerian Moroccan Gas Pipeline, is moved from revalidation to FID. NMPC is supposed to contribute $12.5 billion. They don't have the money. What do you do? You go to the capital markets, you float the NNPC, sell off 25% of the shares. Saudi Aramco wants to sell $50 billion worth of shares. Um, Saudi Aramco did about $156 billion in profits last year. NMPC did $1.5 billion, like 1% of what Saudi, Ar Saudi Aramco did. So Wali Edu has a role of raising the revenue to GDP ratio so that he can reduce the deficit financing in the budget from 43.8%. If you can plow that back below 20%, you're going to have a breather and you're going to have start the process of restructuring the debts and the debt servicing and refinancing costs, Rotus. Thanks for the breakdown from the both of you. Now, Kelvin, you mentioned the capital markets. I'll, you know, I'll keep this as quickly as possible. The Nigerian equity space hitting a 15-year uh, high. Uh, Esther, is the, do, you feel, do you think the, I've been asking analysts this question all week, do you okay. think the Nigerian stock exchange is disconnected from the wider economy? Uh, what do you think? Oh, interesting times in the um, capital markets, right? I don't think there's a disconnect. I think that the truth is that people need options. So investors look, look at all of the options. So what we've seen is um, the all share index at its highest in 15 years. And I mean, that has been driven by different factors and some of its economic factors, right? So just positive sentiments around we have a cabinet now, we have ministers that can work, that's great. Okay, the other thing is actually the performance of comp companies, yep, right? Yep, and yep. that's a fundamental thing. So companies are doing great in the banking sector. We saw GTB's um, H1 results, we saw Stambik and all. So when you have things around this, right, um, investors will continue to come. The last, I like that, is not just the banking sector. So consumer goods, right, so the proposed merger um, to Dangote Foods of several companies. So I like, we like the traction. And I think the final thing I would say here is around the fact that it's not just foreign investors. There was news around foreign investors and um, portfolio investment going back to the um, um, Buhari's administration. But local investors, people like mm. me, I have my money there, right? <laughs> of course, we know that the capital market is volatile. Um, many of us think long term and all, but it's good to see that there's one aspect of the economy that yeah. it's actually growing. You know what I've noticed? When you invest in Nigeria, you, are beco you become a capitalist. You want to make sure the companies are doing well <laughs> and that government doesn't interrupt their, their businesses. Um, Kelvin, you are, you are a fellow capitalist. What do you make of... Uh, of what we've seen on the NGX, on the Nigerian Stock Exchange. Do you think it's, Esther thinks it's not disconnected. Do you think it's disconnected from the wider economy? Rotus, I, I like the way you said fellow capitalist. Well, <laughs> um, to be honest with you, I think the banks and the telecom companies are leading the gyration you see on the all share index, but the manufacturing sector is lagging. You know, I don't think it's sustainable. Yeah, the optimism is good because of reforms. Pro-market reforms the president is implementing, but I've not, I don't think that, I think the book value of a lot of companies are a bit higher than the intrinsic uh, real value of the companies uh, um, that are quoted on the stock exchange. 
Um, you can see that some, some Nigerian banks, tier one banks, took a haircut on um, Ghanaian government bonds, but they've quickly um, come back with revaluation of FX um, 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 assets on their books, and um, they've come back with um, profits on fixed income trading. You know? But when you come to the real economy, the manufacturing companies, manufacturing companies in Nigeria are struggling on um, high uh, borrowing costs, the commercial lending rate, the prime lending rate, uh, they have existing loans, the dependency on those loans has been adjusted because of uh, the increase in the prime lending rate. Um, the cost of corporate bonds, commercial papers, companies are going to the debt capital markets to source for money as against um, you doing rights issue or uh, doing uh, borrowing from, from Nigerian banks. And I expect that inflation is going to continue up, up headline inflation, food inflation, and the MPC will have to keep adjusting the monetary policy rates. Um, I, so I, I think that, look, you, you have the problem of energy costs. You have a problem of borrowing that is affecting the real sector. So if you want to really look at and ask yourself, is the capital market disconnected from the reality on the ground? You look at the manufacturing sector and not the telecom companies and the banks. All right. Thank you for that, Kyle. All right. Let's, let's wrap up with the economy. Um, it's interesting, U.S. Uh, non-farm payrolls came out yesterday. Unemployment in America is 3.8%, and apparently in Nigeria is 4.1%. <laughs> so, uh, Esther, let me, let, me, let me wrap up with you and Kelvin on this, what you make of... Also, GDP in Nigeria, Q2, 2.5. Uh, it slowed down from, I guess, the last year, second quarter last year. So I just wanted to get your thoughts, Esther, on our latest GDP numbers, and I guess the rejigging of the methodology of... Uh, the, of jobs and unemployment in Nigeria. What do you make of it? Yeah, okay, GDP numbers, 2.5%, um, definitely low. We have a population growing at above 3%, so right. you always want to look at that number. So we need to get the number up. Um, not sure, I mean, looking at the year, the year just might end around that range of 2.5%, just because Q3 is where we see the full impact of the recent economic policies and all. So, yeah, but expectation really in terms of medium long term is that by next year, at some point next year, the numbers will go up, the gains will, 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 will become visible if we keep at it and we're consistent and implementing. Implementation of policy is very important. Switch very quickly to the unemployment numbers. Um, <laughs> methodology changed. Okay, we want to ask ourselves if this is a methodology that is suitable for the countries. Lots of debates around it. But whatever is the case, we do agree that, I mean, in terms of engagement of youths and people in the country is very low. And we heard the Minister of Finance also say that. So there's that agreement that, see, we need to increase jobs in Nigeria, not just jobs, the quality of jobs that people actually have. Gainful right? employment. Gainful employment that... <laughs> keeps people out of poverty. So I think that that's the story in terms of the labor statistics. They showed us that many people are still in the informal sector and are just, are just managing to survive, to be honest, right? Yeah, so I like the eight-point um, agenda that, I mean, we saw this week, right? I like the focus on things around food security, economic growth and job creation. Mm. So we need to keep our eyes on job creation and ensure that quality jobs are created, which we just feed into the economy and push our GDP numbers up. Thank you for that. Yeah. Kelvin, you get the last word, GDP and unemployment. So what, what do you make of it from Nigeria? Rotus, you know, 2.51%, the economy is responding to the failed Naira redesign campaign. It's also responding to the demand destruction that we've seen with um, the deregulation of PMS. Um, on, you know, when the principle says that when GDP is growing slower than population consecutively for three quarters, you're in a recession. So I, like Esther said, I guess we'll see what happens in Q3. But I, I honestly think the economy will begin to come out of the woods gradually from the first quarter of 2024. Um, on... I, I don't think that Nigeria is going to grow at 6% like the, this administration is planning in the next two or three years. I think it's going to grow anywhere close to 4.2%, 4.5% if they continue sustaining these reforms within the next three or four years. On unemployment, the methodology that uh, MBS employed, citing the International Labour Organization, the question I have for MBS is, um, are, wage, are wages indexed per hour in Nigeria, number one? Number two, how come companies are using HR outsourcing to employ 80% um, of their staffs and um, 
there is no there's employee casualization in Nigeria. Uh, th these, are, these are the factors you have to address because in the developed economies where they are citing as examples, these are factors, they are you know, protections for the workers. You know, there's nothing like employee casualization. People are paid per hour. Um, there is a proper recording system in, in, for labor statistics. Nigeria does not have a proper recording system. Nigeria has no social, no protection for, for workers. Um, workers are arbitrarily paid. A lot of workers are abused. If you increase minimum wage today from 30,000 per month, which a lot of states have not been able to implement to 100,000 per month, it's still not going to make any impact. It's going to make an impact in government. It will make an impact for worker, people who work for companies um, in Nigeria because you have a situation where companies take advantage of the weak labor laws. So for me, I think the methodolog uh, methodology is flawed and it's even more dangerous because the Monetary Policy Committee of the Central Bank of Nigeria, they rely on the data given by the MBS to uh, make policy. So it's a it's very dangerous precedent, to be honest with you. Great conversation. Kelvin Emmanuel, co-founder, CEO, Dairy Hills Limited in Abuja, here in Lagos with me, Esther Adegunle, business development and economic growth lead at DAI Nigeria. Thank you both for a very robust, informative conversation around uh, you know, business week around the world. Thank you both. Thank you for having us. Appreciate it. Yeah.